Why am I calling them? <laughs> Just wondering. Uh oh, I wasn't prepared for the sermon. Um, you know, today's topic. Today's topic is uh, marriage. And I thought, well, we're going to be talking about marriage. And we have a couple here who has been married, married for about 67 years. Yes. 67 years. Why? That's wonderful. That's about double my age. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Chantal has something for you. John and June, you've been a tremendous support to our church. And we appreciate the fact that God has blessed you abundantly. More than that, God has used you as an example to so many here. So God be with you both. Now, Jose, Jose and Geraldine, um, I've only seen them, but they got married not too long ago, just a few months ago, as a matter of fact. Am I right or wrong? Yes, indeed. So they're just starting, not even a year, not even a year, but they're members of our church, they're happy to be here. Not only that, but they're committed to each other and committed to the Lord. So we want to thank you for being with us. More than that, we'd like to challenge you to keep on going 67 years ahead of you guys. Chantal. How about that? Now, the title of the sermon, if you look at the bulletin, you'll, you'll see that the title is Marriage, what? Marriage is. Let me finish the sentence. Marriage is when a man and a woman become what? When? The trouble starts when they try to decide which one. Once I heard this, marriages are made in heaven. Then again, so are thunder, lighting, tornadoes, and hail. Marriage is. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to pause for a moment. We realize the importance of marriage. We realize that marriage has been bombarded from every angle. Help us maintain commitment, love, faithfulness. Forevermore. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, the family minister's team, they were talking about food and kids and everything else, and I said, My Lord, it's going to be noon very soon, so I'm getting hungry as well. Um, but hey, Believe it or not, we're ahead of time. We're ahead of time. So it's good. I have a little bit more time to preach. Usually I preach for about half an hour. I'll take a double time this time. Because, um, hey, we're, ta we're talking about marriage. Talking about marriage. 
Marriage is so important. And when a man and a woman are first married, they typically share a dream. They want to have a wonderful, loving life together. But too often, after a few years of marriage, it only resembles a field of battle more than a field of dreams. And it's happening more and more now. Now, sometimes it may not be all warfare. Sometimes the combatants may be able to put up a good front, at least when they're around some of the people, so that no one even suspect what's really going on. But with the they're at home, there comes the verbal knives, and they cut each other in pieces to the point in which marriage has become a battle. Sometimes it's not even a cold war, because they don't burn with hot anger. But there is no warmth. There is no affection. It's just a frosty coolness. And the relationship keeps freezing and freezing. Perhaps your marriage doesn't resemble either of us. Perhaps you're doing pretty well. But let me tell you, problems in marriage erupt out of nowhere. Let me tell you what we're seeing day by day is that angry unhappiness, nothing gets resolved. I want to do my way. When it's all over, I'm bruised, somebody's hurt, and nothing is getting resolved because problems are in the middle of two people. Marriage is. I really had to look into several passages in the Bible to find out what's the best way to go when talking about marriage. Because marriage can be a source of great happiness, satisfaction. But marriage could also be a source of intense pain. So we have bad news. But the good news is that the Bible can help guide us through the rough patches. Is that the Bible can even help us avoid some of those patches. It can give us insight. The Bible can give us wisdom. The Bible can relate to us in such a way that we can know exactly where to go. That we can know exactly that there is a different way of treating each other. To be healthy in a marriage. To enjoy what marriage is all about. A way in which we can build up instead of tearing down. Marriage, after all, It's God's idea. God's idea. So it only makes sense that God would have some ideas on how to make our marriages thrive and flourish. Because God doesn't really want us to survive our marriages. And you know, I hear that more and more. Surviving. God wants husband, husbands and wives to enjoy one another. Husbands and wives to bless one another, to comfort, to help, to support one another. That's God's idea. Now, I'd like to begin by saying that I'm well qualified to teach on this subject. Come on now. 
Hey, I'm going to tell you why. My wife and I have been married for 26 years. 26 years. Listen to this now. In all that time, never once has an argument or an angry word passed between us. Mm -hmm. I said I like to begin that way, but I can't. But what I can say is that through the years, mi amorcito and I have discovered some principles, principles in marriage that can make a huge difference in a relationship. And this morning, I'm going to share a couple of those principles. First one, listen to this. And you tell me how you like it. First principle. Seek to serve rather than to be served. Do I, do I hear an amen? Okay, I'll say it again. Seek to serve rather than to be served. Huh, you're not too sure about that, are you? If you're not too sure about that one, let me just give you an illustration about serving rather than to be served. By the way, I heard this on the radio. A man goes to see his doctor after having a mild heart attack. And the doctor takes a man's wife aside and tells her that her only hope of preserving another maybe fatal heart attack is to try to remove all sources of stress in her husband's life. That's what the doctor said. So the doctor then proceeds and gives the wife a list of things he has to do to reduce her husband's stress. And the doctor said, Ma'am, three delicious home cooked meals every day. Ray? Three delicious home cooked meals every single day. The doctor goes on and says, You got to do all the housework. By the way, never argue or disagree with him. And very important, be available for a romantic sexual encounter every night. The wife kept looking at the doctor and said nothing. On the way home, the husband asked the wife what the doctor said to her. Then the wife thinks for a couple of seconds and said, Honey, the doctor said you're going to die. I'm telling you. <laughs> so the first principle is seek to serve rather than, rather than to be served. Now, most of us are naturally focused on making sure that our needs are being met. Is that true or not? Yep, that's our nature. But it takes an intentional effort an act of the will to serve someone else and meet his or her needs. When I speak with couples in counseling, a lot of what they say comes down to this. Pastor, my needs are not being met. 
my husband or my wife is not doing what he or she is supposed to be doing. I'm not getting what I desire. I'm not getting what I deserve. Now, you want to hear something ironic? The more you focus on getting your needs met, the more you try to get someone else, such as your marriage partner, to meet your needs, in most occasions, the less satisfied and fulfilled you will be. Conversely, the more you will find that your own need bucket somehow gets filled up is when you serve someone else. Seek rather, I mean serve rather than to be served. You usually hear at least world principle. Look out for number one. But in kingdom's principle, it's do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I'm going to read a few passages from the Bible. And I want you to pay special attention to this. I'm going to read several passages. The first one is in, uh, found in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. And it says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Then Romans chapter 15 says, Each of us should please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. 1 Corinthians 10, 24, nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. And then finally in Philippians chapter 2, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. What do we say? Now let me ask you a question. When you hear or when you read passages like this, who do you think of? Who do you think of? Who comes to mind as the kind of person you're supposed to be serving and pleasing? The person whose good you're supposed to be seeking? Is it members of a church? Yes, why not? People you work with? Certainly. Friends and neighbors? Absolutely. But isn't that strange? Isn't that strange that the person you're closest to, isn't that strange that the person who lives in our own house, that the person who shares a bed with you, your own husband or your wife, isn't that strange that he or she is the last person you think of when you read passages like this? You know, you read a passage of, uh, like, like, like the ones you, I just read, and you assume it's for some, someone else. Can be my wife. Can be my husband. Yet in truth, that's where it matters the most. That's where it matters the most, in your own home. Why? Because if you can serve your spouse, if you can seek his or her good, if you can look to their interests rather than your own, then listen to this. Your religion is a sham, is a fraud, because no matter how much you may be serving others, home is where it all matters. You see, we've become experts, experts in fooling people. 
Come on. Yeah, because we, we're, we're, we're very good at fooling other people. You can serve people for all kinds of self-serving purposes. Just let me give you a couple of examples here. You can be nice to the people you work with. You can smile with them all the time. You can be gentle to them. And you do it gladly because that's where your money comes from. Now, you can help people at church because somehow when you help people at church, when you smile at people at church, when you're gentle with people at church, they put you in a high regard. This is brother X, sister Y. Many times, you get a lot more positive feedback and praise and affirmation from serving other people than from serving your own spouse. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you serve as a volunteer in the fire department, if you serve as a volunteer as a coach for the little league, or if you deliver meals on wheels, then your name could be honored. You, they might have a banquet for you. Your name might be in the papers. But serving your own husband or wife, that won't get no recognition whatsoever. And maybe not much thanks either. But according to the Bible, according to the Bible, that's something that has to be done out of love. Out of love, out of a heartfelt desire to follow and imitate Jesus Christ. Because brothers and sisters, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the authenticity of this faith comes alive. Home is where matters. Now I can almost anticipate How some of you might be reacting. If you're in a relationship where your needs aren't getting met now, the idea that you should give up seeking your own needs and focus instead on the other person's, that must seem completely unrealistic, if not downright out of order. I've heard something like this before. Pastor, I'm barely surviving now. I have to fight and claw for every scrap of respect and support I get. If I stop doing that and start putting he, I mean his or her needs first, then I'll be taken advantage of. I'll be exploited. My needs will be ignored. I will be left with nothing. I will be nothing. And you know what? To some extent, that is very true. Yeah? That is very true. Because there is no absolute guarantee that your partner will respond in kind to your steps of faith and obedience. There is no absolute guarantee. But listen to what Jesus says. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. You've read that before in Luke chapter, chapter 17. In other words, let me put it this way now. If you try to get your needs met in your own way, if you try to hold on to what you've got by force, coercion, complaining, making demands, then the Bible says, ultimately, what's going to happen? You will lose. You will fail. 
you will lose what you're trying to hold on to. But the Bible says, if you try to lose your life, if you trust God enough to voluntarily give up your rights and stop worrying about what you deserve, and instead you seek in, in, in obedience to see what God wants you to do and serve others, including your husband or your wife, then the Bible says, regardless of how your mate responds, God will be with you always. And God replaces a hundred times over. Because this is a huge step of faith. Because this is what God wants us to do. But the choice is between relying on, on yourself or relying in God's word. Trusting Jesus Christ. And you know what I found out? When I trust Jesus, I gain more than I ever dreamed was possible. Marriage. So the first principle is seek to serve rather than to be served. Okay, that's the first principle. Here comes the second one. Stop trying to change your husband or wife. Did I hear an amen? Stop trying to change him or her. Or to put it another way, hold your tongue. Now I heard some amens. Come on, come on. Now, let me tell you this. My copy of the Bible has over 1,500 pages. Over 1,500 pages. Now, mine is in both Spanish and English. On not one of those pages does it give me instruction on how I can change someone else. On how I alter their character, how I extinguish their bad habits, or how I improve their behaviors. Not once. But what is the Bible full of? Instructions on how I can change. Nothing on how I can change other people, but Lots of things about how I can change. Why is that? Because let's, let's be honest. Changing people is not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Changing hearts has nothing to do with me. That has to do with God. Now, you need to understand, and i got to be very clear here, you need to understand that your marriage ceremony did not make you into a deputy Holy Spirit. He doesn't need your help. So step aside and let him do his job. Now again, this is a matter of faith. Because the natural response that we always have is something like this. Well, pastor, if I don't say something about this, he or she will never change. Well, let me ask you a question. How much success have you had so far in changing your spouse? <laughs> How much of sex have you had so far changing your, your spouse? Have nagging, arguing, scolding, complaining, criticizing, has that been working out for you? Then stop trying to do God's work. 
Let him do what he knows best. Give your, give your husband or wife over to God. Pray for him. Pray for her. That you have to do all the time. And trust that God in his power and wisdom will do something in his heart. You know, Paul says in Romans chapter 14, Who are you to judge someone else's servant? You then, why do you judge your brother? And then he says, each of us will give an account to him, of himself to God. Therefore, listen to this, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Do I hear an amen? Not loud enough. Let me just be clear on something here. God is the judge, not you, not you. Your husband or your wife is accountable to God, not to you. Pastor, what are you saying here? What I'm saying is this, let God worry about whether he or she is doing what they're supposed to be doing. You should pray for them, but you should be more concerned about yourself. You see, if you're being obedient, diligent about bringing your own life into God, then you will be too busy, too busy, and so busy that you can have no time to improve other people, including your spouse. Matthew 7 says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You what? Hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do you get the message? Talking about marriage here. You know what? You know what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 7? Jesus is saying this: leave your husband alone. Stop nagging him. Leave your wife alone. Stop picking at her. That's what God's saying. We all have ample room for improvement in our own lives. More than enough for a lifetime of spiritual growth. And we don't need to take on the additional burden of trying to change someone else. That's exactly what the Bible is talking about. So when you see your husband or your wife doing something they shouldn't, And you get the urge to correct. You get the urgency to say something. What is it that you gotta do? You gotta pray? Excellent. I'm gonna show you what else you have to do. Zip your lip and throw the key away. That's what you gotta do. Of course, there are some exceptions. Because sometimes I do understand you have to speak for the sake. But those times I realize that are fewer than we think. Most of the time, silence truly is golden. Now, if you stop criticizing,
And if you find that you have nothing else to say, then try this. Try praising your wife. Try praising your husband. Try affirming your wife or your husband, thanking him, thanking her. It works wonders. Because once they get up on the floor, you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed at what enormous changes a little bit of praise in the right direction can produce. Praise, affirm, thank. I'm going to ask Pastor Lou to please come up here to the platform with me. Yes, sir, I'm going to get you in trouble now. What can I say? But not only you, I'm going to ask Connie and Mi Amorcito to please come up to the platform as well. I've heard that women talk too much. <laughs> That's what I've heard. So I'm going to let men talk today. Now this time I'm going to ask Chantal to please come. And she's got something special for Pastor Lou and myself. It's not ours. We're just going to give it to our wives. But in just one sentence, not a sermon, Pastor. Just one sentence. Before you give this beautiful bouquet to Connie, your wife, try to affirm her, thank her, praise her. Thank you. These are lovely, beautiful. Honey, I give these to you um, from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say that, you know, just, just the other day, I came home, and my wife had for me, she, she had gone to a Jewish delicatess, delicatessen, and she bought for me two knishas. Those of you who may be Jewish know, knishas are beautiful potatoes, lovely potatoes. She brought, I had no clue she was bringing them home, and she also had a lovely card with those potatoes. Um, I just, special to me. You not only as the, my children, from you as my wife as well. Thank you. Amen. Amen. It wasn't too bad for a sentence. <laughs> it's my turn, Chantel. Chantel, before you go, thank you for these beautiful flowers. You've done a great job. And you know what? She's here today after working all night long. So thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Amorcito. Well, that's, that's how I call her. Yeah, that's the way I call her. Um, I truly honestly love you forever and I appreciate and I thank you for loving me the way you do now I'm gonna ask you to please sit here because we'll go out together sit in here Marriage is a single word of thanks or appreciation can have a lot of power, a lot of power. The Bible says pleasant words 
are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing it. Two simple principles. Seek to serve rather than to be served. And the second principle is just as important as the first one. Stop trying to change him or her. Or hold your tongue. Jesus is still in the business. Of working in marriages. Jesus can still do whatever he can in your husband or your wife. Jesus has the power to change people through the Holy Spirit. Jesus can do many, many things if you let him. Just remember, make sure, make sure that you understand where you are in marriage. And when you let the Spirit do His job, you will see a miracle happening. Will you stand with me as we sing our closing hymn? It's number 286, Wonderful Words of Life. Would you stand with me, please? Father, you design marriage. You created this special bond. You've given us the privilege of enjoying marriage. Help us remember that this is not war zone. This is not Cold War. Help us remember that marriage lasts forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.